Hello, I am Matt Parmley. I'm one of the co-organizers here at Kaiju Masterclass. And today we are joined this session by Mike Bogue. Uh, Mike is a writer and his articles have appeared in Mad Scientist, Wonder, The Lost Films Fanzine, and of course G-Fan. Uh, also, he has a column that regularly appears in uh, Scary Monsters magazine called The Kaiju Corner. And of course, he also wrote the book, uh, the 2017 book, Apocalypse Then, American and Japanese Atomic Cinema, uh, which covers the years from 1951 to 1967. And that was published by McFarland. Mike, thank you so much for joining us at Kaiju Masterclass. It's an honor to have you today. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate you inviting me and uh, look forward to the presentation. And uh, Mike's presentation today is called Apocalypse Then, Mutants, Monsters, and Mushroom Clouds. So Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you and okay. I look forward to seeing your presentation today. Okay. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, yes, as Matt said, what we're going to be looking at are films that involve nuclear weapons and monsters. Um, specifically, we're going to be looking at movies that are nuclear threat movies from the time period 1953 to 1965. And during that period, monsters and mutants basically glutted movie screens. You had uh, atomic anxiety reigning supreme in both Japan and America uh, for these, these types of films. But before we actually jump into the presentation, I wanna ask you a question. Have you ever been awakened by a nuclear explosion? Well, in 1985, I was sleeping on the couch and having a nightmare about nuclear war. I woke up when a loud boom rattled the window. Within a, a couple of seconds, I thought, am I hearing the concussive sound wave of a nuclear blast that just destroyed Fort Smith, Arkansas, 37 miles to the west? Well, when I came to full wakefulness, I realized, no, it was just thunder. We were just having a thunderstorm and a wave of relief washed over me. But the nuclear anxiety that informs that episode, that dream, and I actually dream of nuclear war sometimes fairly often, is the same atomic anxiety that was the background noise for my life and the lives of millions of others for decades. I remember in 1965, I turned 10 years old and very well remember thinking matter-of-factly that there would be a nuclear war by 1970. What I didn't realize then was that that same truth was evident for Japanese children who were also pondering atomic attack. Now, I want to give you a line from a 1954 atomic mutant movie called Them, which we will be looking at. This is a line the elderly scientist gives close to the ending of the film. When man entered the atomic age, he opened the door into a new world. What we'll eventually find in that new world, nobody can predict. I think this line sums up well the, the mystery, wonder, and terror that the atom held for people in the 50s and 60s. It was brand new. Um, it hadn't become passe yet. And films, the nuclear threat films from 1953 to 65, Japanese America, did share similarities, but their subtexts actually clashed. American movies of this period seem to be fairly optimistic. You can conquer the nuclear threat. In, in other words, you can put the nuclear genie back in the bottle. Japanese nuclear threat films from this period are just the opposite. They're very pessimistic. And since the nuclear genie has been freed, you cannot re-imprison the nuclear genie back into the bottle. And as I said, we're going to be looking at examples of all these. We're gonna be looking at mutants, which I think is pretty self-explanatory. Monsters, again, don't think a lot of explanation is needed. And mushroom clouds. Now, mushroom cloud movies look directly at the nuclear threat. Uh, no metaphor is just, just the real deal. I wanna look at three examples of all American Abbey normals. And yeah, I got Abby Normal from Young Frankenstein. These are atomic mutant movies from America during the 1950s. Before I look at a representative American mutant, I want to look at these three examples. The, the tree monster you see is the Tabanga. Radiation helps to bring it to life in 1957's From Hell It Came. The, the metal visual 
you'll see Creature with the Atom Brain. In this film, 1955, released by Columbia, a mad scientist is transplanting radioactive brains into the skulls of dead men, thereby creating atom-powered zombies. Final low-budget film we want to look at momentarily is 1964's The Horror of Party Beach. In this film, the nuclear monsters are created by nuclear waste that has been dumped into the Atlantic Ocean. Now, the film did have a tagline, which was mere weird monsters that live off human blood, which suggests there might also be normal beasts who live off human blood. And of course, there are, and we call them lawyers. I want to look at a representative American atomic mutant. And so we're going to look at 1955's Day the World Ended. This was a film produced and directed by Roger Corman, the King of the Bees. It was released by American Releasing Corporation, which was quickly to become American International Pictures, better known as AIP. Basic premise of the film is that a handful of nuclear war survivors are trying to stay alive in a lead-lined valley. One of the menaces they encounter is our three-eyed mutant here. And one thing I wanted to point out is its countenance. You see in the close-up especially, it has horns, it has a hooked nose, it has a scowl, and very devil-like. And the creature was created by monster maker Paul Blaisdell, who actually wore the costume. Don't know if he was intentionally trying to make this into an ogre, but if it was, then it does personify the nuclear threat pretty well. Now I want to look at a representative Japanese atomic mutant, and that is 1958's The H-Man, also known as Beauty and Liquid People, directed by Shiro Honda. Some people have claimed that the American film The Blob actually influenced the H-Man, but that's not true. The H-Man was actually released in Japan on June 24th in 1958, but the American film The Blob was actually released on September 12th in America, and so since its release came later, it really did not influence The Blob. The premise basically is that fallout from H-bomb testing has turned fishermen into homicidal, liquid-like slime creatures who can also, as you see in the, the visual, can appear as blue-green wraiths. They are quite formidable, difficult to kill. They are finally, however, defeated by flame. One thing I didn't mention is that Marty, our atomic mutant, was killed by uncontaminated rain. One thing I want to want to talk about, we're, we're going to move from human-sized mutants to king-sized mutants, atomic giants, and we're going to look at American one first, probably the best example, is 1957's The Amazing Colossal Man, released by AIP, produced and directed by Bert I. Gordon, who created a number of giant What's It films in the 50s, including 1958's Earth vs. the Spider, and 1957's beginning of the end. An amazing colossal man, an army colonel is exposed to a nuclear blast, which causes him to start growing at the amazing rate of eight to 10 feet a day. However, as he grows larger, less oxygen is getting to his brain. He is quite embittered about the situation. In fact, one of the strongest aspects of the film is Glenn Langan's performance as the Colossal Man. The visuals you see here, one is, is Colonel Manning being exposed to the nuclear blast where it rips off his clothing, basically leaves him with burns. However, of course, he recovers, starts growing. We also see him brooding in a tent outside an American army hospital. And the last slide we see is a low budget rampage in Las Vegas midst variable special effects. I want to look at three other atomic giant films, two American, one Japanese. 1958's War of the Colossal Beast is actually a sequel to The Amazing Colossal Man. In this film, the creature is definitively destroyed. It is, in fact, disintegrated by the end of the film. 1958's Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, released by Allied Artists. Good chance you have heard of it. Uh, title creature, if you can call it a creature, is portrayed by Allison Hayes. One of the, I think, one of the best posters, certainly one of the most iconic 
from the 1950s. Last thing we're looking at is a publicity still for 1966's War of the Gargantuas, which was actually a sequel, and some might say a semi-sequel, a quasi-sequel to 1965's Frankenstein Conquers the World. So we're next going to look at the Japanese atomic giant in Frankenstein Conquers the World. Frankenstein Conquers the World, we have a Japanese atomic giant. And the premise is somewhat interesting. The In World War II, the living heart of the Frankenstein monster is brought to Japan, specifically Hiroshima, which the atom bomb happens to drop at that time. So where did the Frankenstein creature actually come from? There are two basic theories. One is that a boy starving in the Hiroshima ruins eats the irradiated heart and becomes Frankenstein. The other one is that the, the living heart is baptized in H-bomb radiation and therefore grows into Frankenstein. In any event, and by the way, the film actually is supposed to occur in 1960, though it was first released in 1965. The one thing about the, the Frankenstein in this film is that it continues to grow a lot like the amazing colossal man. Now we see the top part of the atomic explosion if you look at the the top right which was unusual the first kaiju movie that actually showed the atomic bombing of hiroshima it had been shown in two other japanese films however 1952's children of hiroshima and 1953's hiroshima frankenstein as i said keeps getting bigger put in a holding cell which he eventually breaks out of and you can see his giant face looking in a window. He's actually looking in at Dr. Tagami, played by Kumi Mizuno, who's been kind to the, the Frankenstein creature. Now, director Ishiro Honda said that Frankenstein is not a monster. He's actually a tragic figure, a giant who is unable to adapt to our world. The title of the film in Japan in 1965 was Frankenstein versus Subterranean Monster Baragon. So, of course, we see lower right Frankenstein fighting Baragon. What else? Now I want to actually pit uh, Nuke Giants West against Nuke Giants East. A little comparison and contrast. To the left, you'll see the amazing colossal man, the 50-foot woman. To the right, you'll see Frankenstein and Gala who is actually one of the two gargantuas in the aforementioned War of the Gargantuas. Now, Gala has an implied habit of devouring screaming secretaries. He has a brother, Santa Brown Gargantua, and they are actually secondhand mutants from Frankenstein Conquers the World. One thing to look at as far as contrasting is, is their looks. You'll notice the colossal men, 50-foot woman, look pretty normal. Frankenstein and Gala, obviously would not win any beauty contest. Another aspect of the films, the Colossal Man and the 50-Foot Woman are both definitively destroyed. Now, the Colossal Man, as I said, returns in World of the Colossal Beast, but at the end of that film, he is disintegrated. On the other hand, at the end of Frankenstein Conquers the World, one of the scientists says he will never die we are not sure of the fate of Gala and his brother Sanda. There is a volcanic explosion in the Pacific Ocean, but we don't know if they're still around or not. The significance of this, the again, in America, there's an optimistic attitude that we can defeat the nuclear threat. Therefore, we can take out our nuke giants pretty easily. In Japan, however, is more pessimistic. The nuclear threat is basically internal and goes on. You can have occasional victories, but you will not win the war. I want to look next at one of the probably the signature subgenre of American atomic mutant movies during the 1950s, and that is the 1954 movie Them. This film, released by Warner Brothers, directed by Gordon Douglas, was the very first big bug movie. Premise was basically that due to nuclear testing, ants have mutated to be eight to nine feet long. They first terrorize the Mojave Desert. Later on, they infest the storm drains of Los Angeles. And it's up to the army to dispatch them. Now, in the visuals we see here, the we have the big visual for the color title them. And that is actually how audiences saw it. Even though the film is in black and white, the title sprang out in color. 
if you look to the right, we see one of the full-scale mutant ants. There are actually only two full-scale mutant ants in the film. The other ants that you see are basically head and shoulders. We also see right next to that full-scale ant, we see soldiers battling the mutant ants in the storm drains. We drop down below that, we see, unfortunately, one of the three leads about to be killed by a giant ant after he has rescued two young boys. And actually fairly significantly, the last thing, bottom right, is the late Joan Wilden playing the character Pat Medford. The reason I bring her up, she's a strong female character, which was a total rarity in American science fiction films of the 1950s. To give you an example, there's uh, a portion of the movie in which the ant bed is suffused with poisonous gas. Pat Medford goes down with the two male leads to investigate the ant's nest to see, are there any ants alive? Did the queens and the consorts escape? She's just as courageous and competent as they are, stays just as professional. Uh, she's not screaming her head off or anything like that. In addition, she takes part in the search and destroy mission in the LA storm drain. So I just wanted to point that out. It's very unusual to see this in a 1950s science fiction movie. Interestingly, even the male lead, James Arness, is nuanced. There's a scene in the film where there's a cave in. So he is kept away from his fellow combatants and a giant ant lunges for him. He ducks and screams in terror. Now, I know the two-fisted American action heroes in the 50s did not scream in terror, but James Arness does, making him a bit more relatable. The true significance of them is that the menace of the giant ants parallels the nuclear threat. It is, in fact, the strongest metaphor for the nuclear threat of any American monster film. And, and there are three ways in which it is particularly. One of them is the elderly science tells us the ants are multiplying quickly. Well, of course, nuclear proliferation was multiplying quickly. The elderly science also tells us is that the ants may exterminate humankind in a year. Obviously, nuclear weapons could exterminate humankind in a short time as well. And the third thing is our triumph over the ants is not necessarily certain, just as our triumph over nuclear engagement was not necessarily certain. Them happened to make a lot of money. It was one of 1945's top money makers. And so, of course, there were uh, them wannabes that followed. Three of those films that followed, one of them is 1955's Tarantula, in which uh, radioactive food nutrient turns a spider into the size of a house. Film was released by Universal International. And if you know who the famous actor and director was who killed the tarantula by, by firing napalm on it, just, just go ahead and, and, and give your guess. It was Clint Eastwood. And if you guessed right, give yourself a Klondike bar. Another thing about the film is that it was directed by Jack Arnold, a very important figure in 1950s American science fiction films. He also directed 1953's It Came From Outer Space, 1954's Preacher from the Black Lagoon, and 1957's The Incredible Shrinking Man. Right next to Tarantula, you see 1958's Monster from Green Hell. In this film, giant wasps, stop motion wasps, wasps in fact, attack Africa. Now, interestingly, they have stunted wings, so they can't fly, but they can crawl around, which they do. Final film we're looking at far right is 1957's Beginning of the End, in which giant locusts attack Chicago. One interesting uh, factoid about this film, the director and producer, Bert I. Gordon, who also did Amazing Colossal Man, had exported dozens of Texas locusts for the climax. He did not count on the locusts being cannibalistic. So when it actually came time to film the, com the, the climax, there were only 12 locusts left. Them even influenced Toho. The first third of 1956's Rodan actually concerns giant prehistoric insect monsters menacing a small coal mining community in Japan. You can see, we, we see the coal miners reacting and then two shots of the, the mega neuron. These scenes were certainly cre effectively creepy. 
directed by Shiro Hana. I first saw this film as a five-year-old, and I did find these scenes quite eerie. Now we're going to turn from big bugs to big beasts, specifically 1953's The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, released by Warner Brothers, directed by Eugene Loray, who also happened to direct 1959's The Giant Behemoth and 1961's Gorgo. This was the first film in which nuclear explosion awakened a prehistoric monster who also personified the bomb. The special effects were provided by stop motion animation genius Ray Harryhausen. And you can see we've got some visuals up of, of the creature going to its spawning grounds, which happened to be New York City. One aspect of the creature is that its blood contains a virulent pathogen, which sends soldiers to their sick beds. So the scientist hero suggests firing a radioactive isotope into a wound in the creature's neck. And it is somewhat ironic that a nuclear explosion gave life to the creature, but it was a radioactive isotope that took the creature out. Beast from 20,000 Fathoms was a monster hit, pardon the pun. It only cost probably around 210,000, but it actually made three to five million, which at that time was a considerable amount of money. So as you might suspect, of course, other studios were jumping onto the Beast wagon pretty quickly. Follow-ups to Beast from 20,000 Fathoms included 1955's It Came From Beneath the Sea, in which H-bomb testing awakens a giant octopus which attacks San Francisco. The effects were provided by Ray Harryhausen, just as he did in Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, but there was a budget's consciousness to the film. The octopus actually only has six tentacles because eight tentacles would have been too expensive. Another film we can see right beneath that, The Monster That Challenged the World, United Artists 1957 release, in which caterpillar-like mollusk creatures menace the Salton Sea area. This film probably includes the most effective mechanical monster of any 1950s American monster film. Next, we're going to look at perhaps the scariest monster from the 1950s, and that is the giant Claw, you'll notice that the studio on the poster, we don't even see its head. And that is because the studio wanted the audience to be terrified when they actually beheld the giant claw. And so without further ado, here is the giant claw. I know, homely as I'll get out. And all of you may have already known, so this may not have been a surprise. A truly an amazing film. I remember when I first saw it, it seemed pretty good for the first half hour until you see it. And I, I couldn't believe it even as, as a kid. I was like, no way. But uh, just wanted to pull that up to add a little, little humor. Now, I want to look at Godzilla's, before we look at Godzilla, Godzilla's closest Western cousin. And you may assume that would be the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, but it's actually 1959's The Giant Behemoth, known in Britain as Behemoth the Sea Monster. We see some scenes of the creature rampaging through London with special effects courtesy of Willis O'Brien. This film was directed by Eugene LeRay, which I mentioned earlier, also directed Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. The similarities between Godzilla and Behemoth. Behemoth shoots out concentric rays of radiation, very much like Godzilla's atomic ray. Also, he exemplifies nuclear threat in terms even of nuclear pollution in the in the sea and of course Godzilla also personifies the nuclear threat you also see burn victims of the behemoth just as you see victims of Godzilla in his 1954 film and finally there's a cautionary note in both Godzilla and the giant behemoth in Godzilla as you probably know Dr. Yamani tells us that if nuclear testing continues, there will be more Godzillas. Well, at the end of the giant behemoth, thousands of dead fish have washed up on the shores between New England and Florida, which makes the two scientists realize another behemoth is afoot. Now we want to turn to the obvious king of the monsters, the most significant atomic age monster, and that is, of course, Godzilla. We see to the left 
two posters. Of course, the, the farthest left poster is for Godzilla's 1954 debut in Japan. And the poster right next to it is for the Americanization, the 1956 Godzilla King of the Monsters. Now, Godzilla truly exemplified the nuclear threat. He was basically a walking H-bomb. His destruction of Tokyo is a stand-in for the atom bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The film in its original form was quite critical of nuclear weapons. One thing director Ishiro Hanad wanted was to make radiation visible. Thus was born Godzilla's atomic ray. Now, the insidious thing about radiation, of course, is you can't see it, you can't taste it, you can't touch it, but it can still have insidious effects. For example, the Lucky Dragon number five. This was a Japanese fishing trawler and on March 1st, 1954. An American H-bomb test pelted the Lucky Dragon number five with fallout that made the crew sick. One of them, the radio operator, died. In addition, the Japanese found tuna being irradiated and they had to throw it away by the ton. Godzilla spoke in a kind of code language to the Japanese for both the Lucky Dragon number five incident and the increasing contamination of radiation in the environment. In fact, in 1955, a third of Japan's adult population had signed a petition to ban nuclear testing in the Pacific Ocean. Wanna, we'll just look at our, our specific visuals here. You see Godzilla attacking the electrical barricade, which of course he just basically smashes through some of the towers. Uh, photo to that immediate right, we see Godzilla continuing his elaborate devastation of Tokyo. Now here, Eiji Tsuburaya and his effects crew really excelled, uh, painstakingly creating 125th scale miniatures, which empowered Godzilla's Tokyo Wrath with nightmarish spectacle. If you look right below the electrical barricade photo, we see Raymond Burr. And of course, this is from the Americanization of Godzilla, King of the Monsters released in 1956, which became a major box office success in America. Now this film did, the Americanization did drop a lot of the original's footage. Burr basically becomes the key narrator, but the effect scenes are still intact, although the nuclear subtext is damaged true. If you look to the right of that photo, we see a photo of some of the injured victims of Godzilla, shown in a somewhat documentary type fashion. Now, these scenes must have evoked chilling memories for Japanese audiences in 1954, just nine years after the end of the war. As we know, Godzilla has continued even today. I mean, he's gone on for decades, but some argue, and I would agree, that the first Japanese film, Godzilla, cannot be duplicated. The Japanese fantasy film journal, when it existed, for example, contended that it summed up Japan's post-war feelings in a way that no other film ever could. Now, Godzilla was a major moneymaker in Japan, sold 9.6 million tickets. And so, of course, we had Godzilla's rising sun, Atomic Cousins, come into being. If you look to the far left, Angurus appeared in 1955's Godzilla Raids again. Like Godzilla, he was also awakened by H-bomb testing. Now, Godzilla Raids again has a second Godzilla because, of course, the first Godzilla was killed by the oxygen destroyer in his first film. Godzilla Raids again tells us that the, the threat from Angurus and the second Godzilla is greater than the threat of nuclear weapons. Godzilla Raids again was released in Americanized form in America in 1959 as Giganus the Fire Monster, which may be perhaps the worst Americanization of any Japanese monster movie. If you look right of Angurus, you'll look at Rodan, the 1966 film, one of the most more durable daikaiju. And similar to Godzilla, Rodan has been awakened by nuclear testing, which causes it to hatch from its ancient egg. And since there are actually two Rodans, we assume there were two ancient eggs from which it hatched. The film was really helped by Eiji Tsuburaya's special effects, especially the destruction effects. For example, the film was released in America in 1957, and a lot of uh, American movie critics actually praised the special effects. 
if Godzilla was a walking H-bomb, then perhaps Rodan could be looked at as a winged ICBM. One interesting thing, if we think about a nuclear explosion, the nuclear fireball is stationary and the blast effects radiate out from it. Similarly, when Rodan is just standing still, gale force winds radiate from his flapping wings. So kind of like, just like the blast effects from an atomic explosion. Rodan, of course, was to appear later, but this remains, I think, one of the best giant monster movies from Japan. If you look at our, our last photo in the top right, this is Space Monster Dogura from 1964, a Toho production, not as well known as Godzilla, Rodan, or even Anguirus. And as you can see, it basically looks like an airborne jellyfish created by atmospheric radiation. The creature is going after carbon in the form of diamonds and coal, and human beings may be the next entree. The special effects crew did hit a home run. The riving tentacles and the fluid body motions are quite plausible. But what about Mothra? Uh, did Mothra have anything to do with the nuclear threat? And we're talking about the 1961 film. Well, we do know in the film that the, the mythical country of Relisica has conducted atomic testing on Infant Island. The ship survivors at the beginning of the film, in fact, are protected from radiation by juice that the natives give them. But did radiation have any effect on the island? For example, the giant molds the scientist discovers or the vampire plant. Did radiation have anything to do with them? And what about Mothra's hatching from her egg? Was radiation a factor there? Now we pretty much assume it's the kidnapping of the twin fairies and the natives appeal is why Mothra hatches, but we're not sure if radiation had anything to do with it or not. Right beneath Mothra hatching, we see Mothra actually going through Tokyo, bulldozing her way through, very invulnerable. Again, just like the nuclear threat was invulnerable. Right below that, we have a shot of the atomic heat ray, which Rolisica had loaned two atomic heat rays to Japan to hopefully destroy Mothra while she is still in her cocoon. As you know, you look at the one black and white publicity still, Mothra, of course, escapes. The publicity still is not an actual photo from the film, but I think it captures the dynamics well. But the question, did the, the atomic heat ray, did the radiation from it actually help Mothra? Did it actually make Mothra stronger so that Mothra was able to come out of her cocoon? We're not really sure. But before we go on, I want to do some comparisons between Japanese giant monsters and American giant monsters. First, rationality. American giant monsters, their motives were fairly rational. It came from beneath the seas. Octopus wanted food. Tarantula wanted food. Beast from 20,000 fathoms goes to its ancient spawning grounds. But the motivations of Japanese monsters, not necessarily so clear. For example, Godzilla attacks Tokyo, but not for food. He, he seems to be doing it just to vent his wrath. Also, Rodan attacks her, or rather his city, also, there doesn't seem to be a, a clear motivation other than just, I'm going to wipe out the city. Another aspect is the uh, personality. The Japanese monsters actually had names, and they're actually fairly invulnerable to military weaponry. American monsters, on the other hand, did not have names. They're just versions of the giant animals, and they were very easily killed. Trench was killed by napalm. Its giant octopus is killed by torpedo. So we can see that uh, not really much going on there. American monsters are much more vulnerable than Japanese monsters. Um, the significance of this, it is, I think, that American monsters exemplify, reflect the American attitude that America would come out on top as terms of the nuclear threat, for example. There was a SAC commander in the 1950s, General Curtis LeMay, and he longed to use what he called his Sunday punch against Russia. And what this would have meant is throwing the entire American nuclear arsenal at Russia all at one time. And he was sure that uh, America would win. You know, there might be 20 to 30 million people killed, but America would come out on top. If we look at Japanese monsters, however, again, they're invulnerable. 
can't kill them. Um, they come back and over and over. And that is, again, referring to the, the genie metaphor. You can't put the nuclear genie back in the bottle. It's out and it's going to stay out. Want to go from big bugs and big mice to, to mushroom cloud movies. And those are movies that deal, deal directly with the nuclear threat, no metaphors allowed. First, I wanna look at three American examples, just very briefly. Then I wanna look at three major American mushroom cloud movies, followed by two major Japanese mushroom cloud movies. To the far left, you see the poster for Five, released in 1951 by Columbia Pictures. As the title suggests, the film is about five survivors of a nuclear blast who get banned together. This film is noteworthy because it is the, actually the first film to show the aftermath of a nuclear war. Right next to it, you'll see the poster for Panic in Year Zero, which AIP released in 1962, directed by Ray Moland, who also starred in the film. The premise, a family goes for a fishing trip, nuclear war breaks out, and the family tries to stay alive in an increasingly savage environment. Final, the, the one to our far right, not to be overlooked, is the extremely low budget. This is not a test released in 1962. Despite that virtually no protection values, it is very effective, however. Simple premise, a law officer is told to hold a roadblock right before a nuclear war occurs. We want to look at now two, or actually three, major American mushroom cloud movies. I want us to look first at 1959's On the Beach, produced and directed by Stanley Kramer. You may have never heard of this film, but at the time of its release, it was a major event. In fact, it simultaneously premiered in 18 world capitals on December 18th, 1959. One of those capitals was, in fact, Moscow. The tagline for the film was, if you only see one movie, it must be on the beach. One movie critic even went so far as to say, this is the movie that may save the world. You see the visuals we have, a top left visual. This is inside the submarine. One of the crewmen is suited up to investigate an irradiated San Diego. Right below that photo, we see the, the suited up crewman in and irradiated San Diego, where, of course, everyone is dead. If you look at the top right photo, this is close to the end of the film. The uh, Salvation Army is, is trying to give solace to people who are unfortunately about to experience fallout that is going to actually kill all of them. You'll notice right beneath that photo, it's actually the same geographical location, but there are no people around. This is after Fallout has hit. In fact, I saw this movie when I was six years old, and I interpreted the absence of people to mean radiation disintegrated human beings. And I wasn't totally far off, as in the film, radiation does disintegrate civilization. The film's basic premise is that there's been a nuclear war, and everyone has been killed except people in Australia and people in submarines. But as I already alluded to, winds are bringing nuclear fallout to Australia. And when the fallout hits, which is in five months from when the movie begins, everyone will be dead. The movie, one of the most powerful aspects is that the Australian government provides the populace with suicide pills so they can be spared the lingering painful death of radiation sickness. Again, this was a, a major film. In fact, it was said to have influenced Toho's 1961, The Last War, which we'll be looking at in just a few minutes. I want to turn now to a very different movie than On the Beach, 1964's Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. This film was a satire directed and co-written by Stanley Kubrick, sprinkled with both laughs and chills. One of my, in fact, probably my favorite scene is we have the Soviet ambassador and American general arguing, and the American president tells them, gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. The film has uh, one of the, if you'll look right to the lower right, 
one of the most iconic scenes from any American movie, I think. We see Slim Pickens atop an H-bomb that is descending into Russia, and you see he's riding it as though it's a rodeo bull. Very powerful scene. I've read that this is physically impossible, by the way. The winds would have just knocked him off, but it, it makes for a, a great visual, very memorable and arresting visual. Finally, American Mushroom Cloud movies, we're going to look at 1964's Failsafe, a very intense film directed by Cindy Lumet. This film is basically Dr. Strange Love without the laughs. By accident, a bomber has flown into Russia with the intent to drop an H-bomb on Moscow. And despite entreaties to return to America, the bomber pilot ignores all such entreaties, as he has been ordered to, actually. The film also includes one of the most horrifying endings I've ever seen. And when I say that, I don't mean gore. I don't mean physical carnage. There's actually none of that in the film's ending, but it does posit in a lose-lose scenario that is unthinkable. Uh, you see a shot of the, the pilot who, like I said, because of orders, he they're accidental orders, but he's not gonna return to America even when his wife begs him to do so. To the right beneath that one, we see Larry Hagman, who's the Russian translator next to him. To the right is Henry Fonda as the American president on the phone with their Soviet premier trying to come to a solution. And here's the basic conundrum. Um, Russia wants, since Moscow is gonna be accidentally bombed, Russia wants America to bomb New York City. I wanna turn from American mushroom cloud movies to Japanese mushroom cloud movies. There are two of them from this time period, 1953 to 1965, we're going to look at both very similar titles, The Final War and The Last War, very similar themes, but there are some distinct differences they have. Now here you see to the far left, the poster for The Final War also went under the title, World War III Breaks Out, World War III, 41 Hours of Terror, a Toei film released in Japan in 1960. Premise is basically that international tensions are moving the world towards a nuclear war. Film follows the hero, a news reporter, and his girlfriend, a nurse, and also follows three families, a high-income family, middle-income family, low-income family, as these events occur. Interestingly, the low-income family shows the most dignity when the end finally arrives. The film, once panic sets in and it's clear there's going to be a nuclear war, the film paints a pretty bleak picture of humankind. In the film, we see thousands fleeing Tokyo. Some resort to looting, some resort to kidnapping, some resort apparently to rape. We have, in fact, the high income family, the father of that family, speeding to get out of Tokyo, hits a pedestrian and just continues on his way. The doctors who work at the, the nurse heroine's hospital flee the hospital just to to escape. She actually stays in the hospital with a sick child whose parents have actually fled Tokyo to save their own skins without actually getting their own child before they left. Like I said, the movie doesn't really paint a, a very noble picture of, of humankind in the end. Now, in the film, thousands of Tokyoites have taken refuge in the woodlands surrounding Tokyo but they are not spared. They also are obliterated by a nuclear blast. One of the most powerful scenes in the film is the camera panning over a charred landscape with scattered tree stumps and dozens of burned corpses. Here we see, if you look to the left, this is actually an American language poster intended for the American theatrical distribution of the film. Right next to that, you see two other uh, slides from the film, two other visuals from the film. One of them is the Dia building being hit by atomic explosion. And the other one is the atomic ruins of Tokyo. The Final War is a very low budget film with sparse special effects. However, the destruction effects, for example, of the Golden Gate Bridge are excellent. They're actually comparable to what Hollywood was doing at the time. 
the film's American distribution is in question. Some believe it did receive theatrical distribution. Some say it did not. Evidence that indicates it might have. There was a license to exhibit that was issued by New York State on December 3rd, 1962. There are the poster materials, and again, you see a poster to your left. And also, there was Castle of Frankenstein number four, which came out in 1964, in which there's a mini review of the final war. And you know, if the reviewer had not seen the film, how could he review it? One thing that was is without dispute, however, the film did experience an American TV syndication and showed an English dub version at least from the mid 60s to the mid 70s. Final War is very gritty, uh, very realistic, and somewhat different than the last war, which we'll look at next. Now we're going to look at Toho's 1961, The Last War. Different than the Final War in that, for one thing, it boasts a bigger budget, it's in color. In fact, it had opulent production values, prominent stars, splashy special effects by Eiji Subaraya. The basic premise here is just like in Final War, international tensions are escalating. It looks like there may be a nuclear confrontation. The film follows a typical Japanese middle class family as events ensue. Now, the father of the family, Frankie Sakai, is in denial. He believes there will not be a nuclear war. The older daughter, however, believes, yes, it's inevitable that there will be a nuclear war. Scenes you see to the left of the Japanese poster, uh, you see the ominous mushroom cloud billowing. In the, the lower visual, we see the ash silhouettes of two soldiers exposed to a, a small nuclear explosion in Korea. We also see now up to the top left, an ICBM missile base at night before the missiles launch. Immediately to the right of that visual, we see the father, this is close to the end of the film, railing against the unfairness of his family's imminent demise. He knows the end is coming. Finally, his denial has been broken through. You look at the photo right beneath the nuclear missile photo. This is the family on their last meal together. Now, the three adults know what's coming. The children are oblivious, but the end does come. An ICBM does hit Tokyo, killing the entire family. And in fact, we see the nuclear takedowns of New York City, Moscow, London. The last people we see in the last war are the crew members of a Japanese merchant ship which has unanimously voted to return to Tokyo, even though they know Tokyo has been destroyed. Now, of course, the audience knows that these sailors are just dead men sailing. I want to look now at a couple of screen captures from the international trailer for the film, because I think this gives Toho's intent. We, the Japanese, are in a better position than people of any other nation to make a film such as this. We side with no one. We are inimical to no one. The Last War is presented as our appeal to the world. Now, I think they're probably primarily looking at, well, Western distribution, but maybe specifically America. The film has one, I think, really crippling weakness. In the film, you never hear the United States or the Soviet Union. Instead, the Federation, which is supposed to be America, and the Alliance, which is supposed to be the Soviet Union. I think this moves the film into science fantasy territory, similar to 1961's Mantra, where Rolisic is an amalgam of Russia and America. I think it would have been stronger if the last war had just actually used the United States and the USSR. But again, I suspect maybe they didn't because they did want it to receive a theatrical distribution in America and didn't want to make anyone unhappy. Second screen capture, it is our sincere hope that by producing and exhibiting this film, we can serve the cause of peace. So what about the last war in terms of theatrical distribution? Well, Brinko Pictures did acquire in 1964 the film to be released in the U.S. You may know that Brinko also released The Human Vapor and Gorath on a double feature in 1964. 
Brickle took the film, they redubbed it, and they actually cut a tremendous amount of films, film footage. They, they cut it from 110 to 79 minutes. Brinko went out of business. Heritage Enterprises acquired the film rights, and they distributed it to television, where it played from the 60s through the 80s. In fact, I first saw it in late 1979. Video Gems in 1985 released a video version. And I have a picture of it here. I actually happen to own a copy, which is at this point a collector's item. It is interesting to see what the Americanization, what changes it makes. For example, in the middle and end of the film, it uses the Walt Disney song, It's a Small World After All. And also at the end of the film, we have uh, the statement from John F. Kennedy, mankind must end war or war will end mankind. Now, reportedly, the last war, a subtitle version actually did play in Honolulu, Hawaii at the Nippon Theater on December 29th, 1961. It resumed showings on January 3rd, 1962. That would be very interesting, and I'm assuming it happened. It sounds as though it probably did, but unfortunately, the film did not get any kind of theatrical release in stateside in the, the mainland of the United States. Now, I want to indulge in some shameless plug time. If you have found the subject matter of this presentation interesting, I have written a book called Apocalypse Then, American and Japanese Atomic Cinema, 1951 to 1967, which Matt told you about at the beginning of the presentation. It is a continuation of the, the themes you see here. Basically well-reviewed and, in fact, did receive a a recommendation from NPR. If it's too expensive, you might just want to check it out from a library. Well, I hope you have found this presentation worthwhile and uh, want to wish you best of, of luck in the future. I want to turn it over to Matt. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, thank you so much for coming to Kaiju Masterclass for this session and presenting. Um, if anyone wanted to reach out to you or do you have any tags on social media, um, any specific email addresses you wanted to share? Uh, actually, no. Sorry. No, on Facebook, I do, however, have a page. I'm one of the only Mike Bogues. <laughs> and I do have a page for Apocalypse Then on Facebook. And it's it's pretty easy to locate. Awesome. Well, that concludes this session of Kaiju Masterclass. Uh, please stay tuned to the YouTube channel as we will have additional programming coming shortly. Thank you.